as mentioned, my name is Jacinta Parsons, and I'm from Double J. And I'd like to say firstly, how excited I am to be at Big Sound this year. Big Sound have put together one of the most exciting and inspiring conferences with keynotes and panel discussions that I know will be significant to genuinely challenge, celebrate and evolve our music community. Big Sound have gone from strength to strength and it's such an essential time for us to put our heads together and make sure we move forward together. I have the enormous pleasure of introducing the auspicious first keynote speaker who's gonna kick off this conference this morning. And once she's spoken, I'm gonna join her on stage for a conversation. Musical eras are created by extraordinary artists who push out and craft music that generations of fans define themselves within. The music they make can locate us, transform us and unite us. It can also break us and challenge us. Kim Gordon is one of those artists whose uncompromising, authentic and fearless art has for over 30 years pushed out and encouraged us to think beyond the mediocre. She was a visible girl in a band who blazed a trail for the Riot Girl movement, who largely attribute her as the inspiration for those bands who sought to liberate us girls from the male white corporate oppression. She's a celebrated visual artist who exhibits around the world. She's a founding member, songwriter, guitar, and bass player of Sonic Youth, who achieved a worldwide cult following of loyal fans for over 30 years and 15 albums. More recently, she's performed with Bill Nace of Bodyhead and a surfer dude called Alex Nost of Glitterbust. She's an actress, a designer, and now the author of her memoir, Girl in a Band. And last night, if you were lucky enough to catch her, you would have seen her perform with her brand of Fierce. She continues to create music and art that challenges us and in her words, gives us something that we didn't know we wanted. And today she joins us to share with us some of her story. I'm giddy with freaking excitement to welcome to the stage, Kim Gordon. Thank you. Thanks. That's very nice. <laughs> uh, it's great to be here. Australia has always been a, a great uh, friend to Sonic Youth has, and given us a lot of su support over the years. I have a lot of really good memories of playing here. Um, and uh, it's funny to be giving a talk. It's much more nerve-wracking than <laughs> playing guitar. <laughs> uh, the name of this uh, talk is called Performance in Music as a Disruption. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> these things are funny. <laughs> uh, rituals, rhythm, melody, sound, noise, the sounds of a junkyard, the thing that takes you out of yourself, the thing that makes you into an object of projection, admiration, adoration, inspiration, many words ending in T-I-O-N. From the person to the thing, to the ineffable, that before you realize has more to do with transcendence than it does to you. The responsibility to the audience. The audience, something that becomes bigger than either of you. As Girl Marcus says in his intro to Mystery Train, in the work of each performer, there is an attempt to create oneself, to make a new man Okay, this was written a long time ago. <laughs> Out of what is inherited and what is imagined, each individual attempt implies an ideal community, never easy to define, where the new man would be at home, where his work could communicate easily and deeply, where the members of that ideal community would speak as clearly to the art artist as he does to them. The audiences that gather around rock and rollers are as close to that ideal community as anyone gets. The real drama of a performer's career comes when the ideal that one can hear in the music and the audience that the artist really attracts begins to affect each other. We're gathered together, a family of sorts. 
The family that we have or seek after we as teenagers leave our parents, suspended in an identity that is exciting but safe because there are others like you who like this. You're finally not alone in something. It's a codependent relationship. Marcus goes on. If the audience demands only more of what it has already accepted, the, audience, the artist has a choice. He can move on and perhaps cut himself off from his audience. If he does, his work will lose all the vitality and strength it had when he knew it mattered to other people. Or the artist can accept the audience's image of himself, pretend that his audience is his shadowy ideal, and lose himself in his audience. Then he will only be able to confirm. He will never be able to create. But it's not just the artist who is pressured. The 60s, beloved because it embodied this idea more than any other time, an identity, an identity of the individual with a movement in music. Not the sexual awakening of 50s teenagers music, but as a group awakening. Hysterical, Beatle, Rolling Stone fans, crying girls, together fueling each other chilled out tripping hippies, the musician hippie rock star living in Laurel Canyon, etc. the glamour of that. There was money beginning to happen and a feeling of separation between musician and the movement, whatever the movement really was. Freedom from the man, free love, freedom from the establishment, the country's midlife crisis. This is a poem this is not an essay. This is an intervention into history. Out of my mind, and I just can't take it anymore. Out of my mind, and I just can't take it anymore. Left behind by myself and what I'm living for. All I hear are screams from outside the limousines that are taking me out of my mind. Through the keyhole in an open door, happy to find that I don't know what I'm smiling for, tired of hanging on. If you've missed me, I've just gone because they're taking me out of my mind. Uh, Neil Young lyrics. <laughs> the crack of idealism between audience and performer, relationship reflected in the beginning of the end of the 60s. I'm sorry, <laughs> I was correcting my, I can't read my own handwriting. <laughs> the crack of idealism between the audience and performer, the relationship reflected the beginning of the end of the 60s. Altamont, the riots here in the inner cities, Watts, Detroit, and in May 68, France. The Manson murders, 69. The festival film, Isle of Wight, shows the audience breaking through the makeshift walls, the walls that didn't used to be there. In the huge outside space, chants of rip-off and expectations for free music create havoc on the festival. Vibes and performers fear for their safety. Joni Mitchell at one point stops playing and starts crying because people aren't listening. She knows that it is over. Other performers are canceling because it's deemed not cool to play, and some are worried about their safety. Another documentary for a small festival, Folk Celebration Festival in Big Sur, took place at Esalon, a rich hippie spa for developing self-awareness through the body. This was post Woodstock. It was a successful mix of rock, folk, and soul with the audience on one side of the swimming pool and the performers on the other. During Crosby, Stills, and Nash and Young, someone from the audience gets up and goes over to their side and starts ranting about their fur coats and that they're sellouts. There's an altercation. Stills tries to calm the guy down and ends up getting into a scuffle. 
and then Stills uses the situation as a lesson and an intro into the next song. He says, how we can all fall into that trap of money. Is he a leader? People are looking to them to calm the situation and make it back to where it was. The trap, the trappings. Which side are you on, brother? The 70s became the era that learned how to exploit the youth culture. Corporate rock is born. But by 1977, the Clash have written a song with the lyrics, No Elvis, Beatles, Rolling Stones. Iggy Pop and the Stooges are often cited as the beginning of punk. Under the beatific 60s was Detroit, the Stooges, Iggy Pop. They were a disruption into what was supposed to be entertainment and positive vibes. Iggy walking out onto the audience, breaking glass, smearing peanut butter on himself. Was this a stage show? Was this rock music or real life? His, estr his estrangement of the audience expectations created something new. He gave people something they had never seen. We're going to have a real good time tonight, almost forcing it down the throats for the audience. 1969, OK, all across the USA. Was it? Turning them into a violent frenzy of fun, the F word Iggy style deconstructing the idea of what entertainment is. What is a star? Suspended adulthood? A place beyond good and evil? Someone who you want to believe, believe in him or herself? A daredevil? A risk taker going to the edge and not falling off for you? There were others, of course. The Velvet Underground, The Doors, Hey, they were all risk takers at one moment in the 60s, when no one knew where any of it was all going. And before them, the beats, and before them, the avant-garde artists, futurists, fluxus, and before them, et cetera, et cetera, Rembrandt. The black men's blues, outsider music, a mourning for what's expected, but it's never going to happen. So we dance and play and forget for a moment that we are all existentially alone. Get me out of the nine to five and onto the weekends. This is not an essay. This is a poem, not a poem, an incantation, a lament for something other. Cut to PIL performing at the Ritz, New York City, 1981. The Sex Pistols are over. Sid Vicious is dead. Public Image Limited has made an impact. Their third record, Flowers of Romance, is a mystery. There is a girl on the cover. They are finally here. The crowd anxiously awaits them. The huge screen where the videos are projected before the band's play is still down. There is a strange film projected on it of the girl getting out of a garbage can it's in a dark alley. I'm excited because it looks like it was made especially for New York City. The film stops, but the screen doesn't come up. The band is on stage. Their shadows are seen behind the screen. They don't pull the screen up. The audience becomes infuriated because they can't see the band. People are yelling and start to throw metal chairs, which have been placed in rows on the floor as if it's a theater. The band runs off stage, and the audience destroys the, hu destroys the huge screen. Our expectations have been crashed. For whatever reason, PIL fucked with our heads. Maybe they were trying to do something mysterious to go along with the minimalist aesthetic of the record. We were there because of their audacity but then couldn't accept what they were offering. It was too much or too little. That experience will never be seen on YouTube or be downloaded. You can't even see a picture of it because the internet didn't exist and no one was paying attention. No one was documenting, except a zine by these 15-year-old girls in Europe called The Decline of Western Civilization. 
For this reason, the 80s are the new 60s, or rather, it is now all part of the same pre-internet life. The nostalgia for pre-internet, 1993, is pervasive. What was it like to be wandering around, unknowing, scrunching for bits of information? But is what we get out of a performance any different now than it was then? A transcendence, or just a distraction from daily life? Humdrum pain, humdrum boredom, humdrum aloneness. A nice transition that doesn't end. A day at the beach, a trip to the mountains. Maybe that's all it ever was. An unending kiss leading to nowhere bad or somewhere that you never dreamed of. That's what I want to feel when I go see someone play. Something fall apart until it becomes something else. This is all too romanticized. I saw Dave Chappelle, the comedian, perform at the Oddball Festival in Hartford on his comeback after disappearing from the culture. No one had ever put together a traveling all comedy festival involving stand-up comics. Live Nation put it on. Funny or Die promoted it. This was the fourth on the tour. Dimitri Martin, Flight of the Concords, performing before Chappelle, all seemed to express in different ways a bit of a hard time with the audience. People coming in and out talking. It was a huge arena. They handled it with humor. There's nothing a stand-up comedian hates more than people talking during their time, space. They are the most vul vulnerable of performers, using their personality, not actors doing a skit. They like to control the situation, own the space and time they have. If they lose the audience, they want to try and win them back. When Dave Chappelle came out to glorious, much anticipated applause, it was a great moment. I was almost tearing up. After about 10 minutes, Chappelle started asking people to stop talking and let him do his act. People continued and stepped up their banter, yelling things out to him. He took his pack of cigarettes and said he was patient and could wait out his contractual 25 minutes on stage, which he did staying even longer, continuing to talk to the audience. The audience just got messier. He hung in there looking somehow for a way back, staying longer than 25 minutes, finally walking off after saying goodnight. The next night in Pittsburgh, I heard he killed it. The sound on stage can determine how one feels connected to the audience. As a performer, I've certainly been there. The biggest nightmare was probably when we played Neil Young's Bridge concert for the first time. It was supposed to be totally acoustic. We'd never played acoustically before. I brought a guitar to smash as I had a feeling things were doomed to fail. Um, the Bridge uh, concert is a benefit for kids with uh, cerebral palsy, by the way. At soundcheck, we could hear our guitars, which were just mic'd, no pickups going into amps. But when we went out to play, we heard nothing. For us, a group that relies on the interplay of guitars, it was a nightmare. We knew also that we truly were playing before a mainstream rock audience. When we attempted a cover version of Personality Crisis, uh, we got halfway through, and then I yelled, fuck! into the mic and smashed the awaiting acoustic guitar. <laughs> then Willie Nelson came out and did a medley of his songs, followed by Don Henley with a full electric band. <laughs> so much for rules. I felt terrible that I had yelled out the F word. As we walked off stage, I saw the row of kids in their wheelchairs sitting at the back of the stage. <laughs> 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 I had forgotten about them. <laughs> I had forgot them about them being there. Later, Ben, Neil's son, came up to me in his wheelchair and said, everyone has a bad day sometime. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, thanks.
now we're going to have a little um, Q uh, and A session here on stage. These great awkward moments. Kim Gordon. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. I want to start talking about some of the things you touched on there, the idea of rebellion. You are a visual artist. You would describe yourself that way, and you mm -hmm. have been since you were very young. And your very early days of making art in LA were done in a way where there were no rules, nothing was graded. And then you moved into a more conventional kind of art world where things became like that. And you had your first moment of rebellion against that. Was that a really important part of how you've always seen your art? Um, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. I, um, I, the first things I did in New York sort of came out of necessity because as a young artist, um, you know, I didn't have a gallery and I didn't know how to get a gallery or uh, find a place to show my work. So um, my, uh, this, um, artist friend of mine, Dan Graham, um, said to me and this other young artist, um, we, we, we'd both moved there without peer groups from our art schools, and he was like, well, everyone needs a group here. And <laughs> anyway, we'd, uh, I thought of um, this thing called design office. It was called sort of like a, a way to feel like it was kind of a collaborative group. There's a, a little bit of that going on, and. There is a history of that in, in, um, in the art world. Um, but the idea was to do intervention in people's apartments. And Interventions. Yeah, sort of a, <laughs> like interior decorator intervention, <laughs> where you do um, sort of psychologically based, like. That sounds horrific. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, I only did a couple things in apartments, um, yeah. but uh, my friend Dan, who lived upstairs, was willing. And um, like he never cooked, so I, th these were railroad apartments where the bathtub is in the kitchen. Yeah. And um, so I got rid of his stove, and I um, I put in this um, a Pirelli tile that he always talked about. He was obsessed with it. It, it was like in bank foyers um, at bank machines, and uh, and then I did a. Um, watercolor on uh, typewriter paper of Debbie Harry, because he was obsessed with, um, he used to write articles about um, feminism and rock and roll and stuff like that. And um, so, and he put that up next to his Joe Bear minimalist paintings, this watercolor of Debbie Harry. Anyway, so there, there were always like two things, something that was practical and then some, um, some kind of, uh, or aesthetic object that reflected something about the person. And then I would write about it and publish it in a magazine. Did you do, did you do it with people who didn't know it? Uh, mostly I, I uh, did it with people that I knew, although I, I had a show at this uh, alternative space called White Columns where I asked different people to, if I could use their chairs. And because it, the space was like a showroom, it had that sort of feeling. It was like in an old deco building. So and I brought these um, kind of hybrid chairs in from different people's house and arranged them in the space. And then I redid the um, office there into um, like a more of a dining room because it was supposed to be like a, they wanted it to be like a neighborhood public place or something. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about you and playing music. Many people in this audience will be pleased to know that you've worked really hard over your career not to learn your instruments technically. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, in fact, you, you go out of your way to say that you're not a musician. And I've heard a lot of musicians talk about this sweet spot where mm -hmm. you know enough to do it, but not too much. Why? Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, I come out of, you know, um, sort of post-punk kind of, um, you know, where a lot of people got into um, music that way through through punk for one reason or another it was more of a <coughs> you know a little bit of a um, like I, I has I'm hesitant to use the word political I mean it was only political to maybe 
McLaren, because he was influenced by situationalism. Um, but, it, but it was political um, in England. Mm. Uh, it became you know, a platform for, um, you, know, for, for you know, just kind of um, frustration at, at the culture. And it's kind of interesting because um, right now it seems like the culture is the culture at large is frustrated, but they don't know how to make punk rock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you just, you know, it <laughs> comes out with right wing expression or, uh, the you know, banning immigrants. And, um, Why do you think we've lost the capacity to make punk rock? Um, I don't know. I, you know, I just think that um, there is, it's funny, it's, it's, People have an idea that punk rock is a, like a certain aesthetic, and it really isn't. Like the the way it evolved in New York, sure, like Richard Hell, you know, had safety pins and torn T-shirts and stuff like that. But um, it really was, you know, that that the New York scene really came out of, um, um, you know, the tradition of really the poetry scene there and um, kind of the beat world in a way. Um, like Tom Verlaine and Richard Hell were both poets, mm. and that's why they moved to New York. Um, and I, so it wasn't, you know, the aesthetics weren't, you know, they're to like, it's more of an attitude, you know, and um, it's funny because uh, I was at this fashion show <laughs> in New York for, um, uh, Saint Laurent, and it was at a club. It was at this big club, Palladium, and the the aesthetic of the clothes was all um, sort of 2001's LA vintage store, you know, look, and um, but super expensive, you know, like really well made versions. And, but and everyone was there. It was like you know, like. Um, I must feel like Barbara Streisand was there. I don't know if she really was or not, but it was just like, uh, you know, the front rows were like his people. And <laughs> and um, and then afterwards he had like 50 bands play, like till five in the morning or, so, or something. And I don't know, I ran into Mike D there and not to name drop, but. We love it though, it's <laughs> um, And we were both shaking our heads. It was like, this just isn't punk rock. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and that was kind of, um, uh, it's, it's, there's only a few people who know what that means, and, and uh, <laughs> I can't even really explain it to you. <laughs> but um, no, I think that there's, um, you know, music has just gone in different directions, and there's, um, I mean, I have to say the closest thing to punk rock is the experimental music scene, mm. um, which is more underground. And um, so, you know, I don't know why, but it just, it does seem to me that um, I think looking for kind of edginess or um, people making comments about the culture, it's maybe happening in other places or it's happening in hip hop music That's still. It, yeah. And I was some hip hop is probably the genre that's dealing with. Yeah, a lot but of the again, like hip hop has become like R&B, which, uh, you know, it's all kind of, uh, all the genres are sort of, you know, mashed together, which is fine, it doesn't really matter. Punk was, uh, you know, when Sonic Youth formed in the 80s, was still the the kind of driving concept, mm -hmm. as you say. But then came No Wave. Mm -hmm. Well, it was, well, yeah, I mean, punk, um, like by the time I got to New York, it was sort of almost the end of the No Wave, which was, uh, if you don't know what that is, it's just like uh, nihilistic music. <laughs> uh, whereas like three chord punk was, was more, um, actually, the kind of the structure of it, aside from s a few bands like the Slits or the Raincoats, was yeah. kind of, there's some that were deviated from three chord rock and roll, but the musically it was kind of uh, conventional in a certain way. Yeah. And No Wave, and naive, no wave was like totally like much arty, or it was just kind of about freedom and music, and, and it was pretty uh, you know, dissonant music. What moment, uh, because you did go to New York to be a visual artist, or to, you were a visual mm -hmm. artist, but to, to make uh -huh. those bigger connections, 
What was the moment when you decided and knew that music was also going to be part of what you did? Uh, well, this artist, Dan Graham, um, he had this kind of well-known performance piece called um, Audience Performer Mirror, something like that. And um, he would have a big mirror behind him and he would look at the audience and start describing the audience, like the gestures and, you know, with, uh, the general mood and specifics. And then he would turn around and look in the mirror and describe himself, um, his stance and his self-consciousness. And he wanted to do that with an all-girl group um, because he was obsessed with <laughs> all-girl groups. <laughs> um, and he asked me if I would um, make one for this performance. And he introduced me to this girl, uh, Stanton, Miranda Stanton. And um, we formed a band and we performed it once at the ICA. And then it was, um, after that I was like, well, I don't know what to do now, which, because it was really fun. Because um, of that audience interplay that you talked um, about mm -hmm. just then. Right. It's really different. It's influenced by yeah. definitely Dan, actually a lot of Dan's work. Yeah. Um, different than being a visual artist who creates in isolation. Yeah, um, you know, Dan really feels uh, that, you know, it's not enough just to, yeah, be in your studio, the romantic artist making uh, objects to sell. You know, you write articles, you um, lecture, you do other, other things. You've kept to that, haven't you? I kind of, yeah. Good teaching. <laughs> Um, I want to ask you, uh, you know, making that noise, you know, you said it was that experimental sound, it was about going deep into that. You've said before that extreme noise can be incredibly cleansing. Mm. Do, you, do you think music is therapeutic? Oh, uh, sure, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's um, it kind of, you know, like when I work in my studio, it's if I have music on it really helps me focus on what I'm doing or what sort of music do you listen to into oh really not noisy music <laughs> oh I don't know like Steve Gunn I'm really into yeah. him these days yeah um Angel Olsen or right. yeah um I don't know um Tusk <laughs> believe <Yeah. it> back. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's so funny um yeah Bill, who I play with in Body Head, we suddenly got into that record a few years ago, and I don't know, it was funny that that record was so hated. People said it was just the worst record ever made, and uh, was that it cost so it? much money, and yeah. I will say the artwork is horrible. <laughs> it's like the ugliest <laughs> art I've ever seen on a record, but <laughs> it's, it's kind of actually really good. That'll be the quote we take out from today. <laughs> yeah. Kim Gordon, ugliest artwork ever. Um, I, jazz, too, was mm. a huge part of growing up. You listen to it a lot. Right. And it's really informed the way that you have sung throughout. Can you talk to us about the way that you saw... A lot of the female jazz singers especially mm. stood aside from, you know, the Janis Joplin's in a mm. way for you and the way you understood thinking about singing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, Janis was a huge influence. Um, but, yeah, that... Uh, listening to people like Billie Holiday, who had amazing phrasing and um, the way she used space was so, so important. And um, and then also, you know, later when I discovered Serge Gainsbourg and um, Jane Birkin, you know, the, yeah. their use of space was really incredible. And, uh, you know, I, I have a pretty limited range as a singer, so I think I really related a lot to uh, <laughs> the space <laughs> as an element to use and rhythm and Do you think texture, things like that. We can be afraid of space. Sometimes we, we're trying to fill it up always and part of that rebellion and part mm. of allowing it to collapse is also mm. allowing for space. That's true. Yeah, like just not trying to control everything, I guess. Yeah. Talking um, about uh, Sonic Youth, you know, um, an indie New York no wave band that um, eventually a major label came knocking because they saw the commercial potential. Sonic Youth seemed to um, manage that in an incredible way at a time in the 90s, I suppose, when there was such a reaction to this concept of selling out that commercial idea. 
how did you go and make that transition into that world and maintain what you have throughout your career of, of fundamental authenticity? Well, we, um, you know, we were, we were kind of um, dissatisfied with our label situation. It was sort of frustrating just not being able to get records out, distributed yeah. well, and um, I guess, you know, we fi we'd been together for 10 years, so we just thought, well, if it doesn't work, you know, we've been together 10 years. It's been cute. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and uh, yeah, so we kind of, you know, we were always curious what our songs would sound like with a bigger production or a bigger budget for recording. Um, and, you know, we weren't really, um, I don't know why they saw us as, you know, just in the air, I guess alternative music was becoming this thing, like Lollapalooza galvanized. And a genre called alternative yeah, music. Yeah, exactly, it became like a radio format is what it was, and uh, Lollapalooza showed that there was an audience for this kind of music. Perry was um, kind of galvanized things, actually. Um, so I guess they were in the mood <laughs> for signing bands that, you know, came yeah. out of the indie world. And, um, you know, and our A&R guy kept saying, oh, you guys could be the next Pink Floyd, and we'd be like, <laughs> <What's> okay, <laughs> <the> <laughs> do we have to? Because, you know, I mean, I love early Floyd, but at that point, that was wh what <laughs> punk rock was railing against. Yeah, <laughs> so it yeah. was kind of uh, confusing. But uh, we, um, <laughs> we basically, in our contract, we could do anything we wanted as long as it didn't com compete commercially. So we did eventually start our own label once we got money for s our own studio. Uh, so we could just put make more experimental music and not have to promote it. You know, just the whole machinery of the record label. Of, you know, it's like. Um, so basically, we, it, you know, they kind of left us alone. They didn't really promote our records that well, but then they let us do what we wanted. And yeah, what about for you on a personal level, where you go from a you know a band that is known for its, its fans mm -hmm. but goes into this really big success. Were you prepared for what that was? Well, it wasn't really big of <laughs> success for one, one thing. Um, I mean, I, I guess it did somehow elevate our name a yeah. bit, but um, you know, we were never really successful. Like we weren't even as successful maybe as the Pixies, I mean, as far as record sales. Yeah, but we don't judge that way. <laughs> <laughs> we judge in other ways. Um, but you know, you know it was, for us it was like such a slow, gradual evolution. I mean, I can't imagine what it's like being a band starting out now. I just, um, except that, you know, like when we started, we didn't actually think about, we had no plan. It was just baby step. It was like, oh, let's get a gig at CB's, let's go on tour in Europe. You know, th they were things like that. It, we didn't have some, we never thought of, uh, about signing to a major label or anything like that. Um, it was kind of, um, and it was also more of a spirit of let's, you know, without sounding pretentious, it was just like the atmosphere of downtown New York was, um, you know, let's make something that will surprise people or let's, you know, th you know we can do whatever we want, sort of. Yeah. Did you, did you feel any um, interest around what you were writing about when that, that audience base, I guess, grew? Mm -hmm. Did you, I mean, uh, the song Karen mm -hmm. Carpenter's, you know, Karen was, mm -hmm. what was your thinking? Well, I just thought um, that, you know, when you're always thinking of lyrics, um, there are a lot of lyrics about women or there's a lot of subject matter that hasn't been written about and basically, almost anything can be made into a song or lyrics or subject. So, um, uh, so I don't know, that's why I thought of the, the lyrics to Tunic about Karen Carpenter. I mean, I w we were listening to her, their records, and something that I remember was such, seen as such establishment music or like bank commercial music. Yeah. Like, 
20 years later or, or whatever out of the context, you could just kind of listen to it for what it is. And we rented all these, um, this reel of videos that they did that were so weird and creepy and kind yeah. of, uh, <laughs> um, that, uh, oh, and, and Todd Haynes did this movie with Barbie dolls about the um, Karen Carpenter story, which was That's so spooky. It was a bootleg. It, it was so good. You know, yeah, you forgot right. after a while that there were dolls. And yeah. so we would kind of like been kind of looking at that stuff. And then, um, yeah, I just thought oh, that that would be a good, you know, song or something. Mick Harvey, um, I've spoken to him before. You're you're friends with him. He's spoken about um, the Boys Next Door, for example, as being the magic of a band that wasn't about the best uh -huh. guitarist gets the best bass player. Sure. But it is something about the chemistry of who, what, where, when, how. Would you describe uh -huh. Sonic Youth in that same way? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the music, our music was kind of based on our personalities or the way we would make music. We each brought something. Uh, I brought a lot of minimalism <laughs> 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 and space. Uh, <laughs> no, but I, uh, you know, there definitely was. Um, yeah, bands are funny. You know, they're like uh, these weird families that, yeah, you take one part out and it just becomes a completely different thing. And uh, with our music in particular, because we would sort of a lot of times, even if. Thurston would bring in a riff or something, we would sit around and play and kind of jam on it and kept arranging and arranging. Uh, um, so, yeah, it was all, you know, none of us were trained musicians in the studio sense, so we were all, you know, eccentric in some way. Um, there bands are also, uh, you know, re renowned for being really difficult creative environments because there's so much competing mm. interests, I suppose. But you've maintained a creative, you know, output for mm. for such an amount of time and so many albums. What was the key to that? Um, well, we just really liked the music, for one yeah. thing. And also we, um, you know, we shared all our publishing equally. For that better, is a real key. For better or worse. But yeah, so you, you don't have someone writing uh, lyrics yeah. just because they want publishing or something. <laughs> And saying so you don't uh, like that because you want to get a line in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, you know, it's, it's difficult, though, because we were fairly democratic and um, it can be really tedious, band dynamics, especially yeah. if you're mixing. I think we did better when we finally found people who we all felt comfortable with to help us mix our records. And like Jim O'Rourke was, I think, the first. And then um, the last few records, uh, John and Yellow, and all the touring that you have to do with each other is just, it's just an unusual situation to be in, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it is, what I was going to say earlier, it's like a family that you do things for a reason and you're not sure why. It's kind of like this weird psychosis. And, um, you know. Do you, do you miss playing with Sonic Youth? No. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I felt like. Next quote. I did no. that a lot. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you do something you for, for 30 years or 25 yeah. years, it's time to do something else. And I, I, um, I mean, I regret, I guess, that we didn't have one last, like, hurrah of touring around the world and making lots of money. Thurston <laughs> came out saying <laughs> that he thinks it's not over. What's that? Thurston has said he thinks it's not over. Well, you know, the records are still out there, so. Um, it's not over. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. Last year... <laughs> <laughs> this, we'll sit in our silence just for a moment. <laughs> uh, last year we had a really powerful keynote delivered by Jessica Hopper who spoke mm -hmm. about, I guess, the sexist music industry that's excluded and limited mm -hmm. opportunities for women. And your memoir, which if you haven't read it, you need to, go on a band. Um, it's the question that you loathed, obviously, the most, but it was the one that you got asked the most. What's it like to be a girl in a band is the mm -hmm. question. But it's been 30 years you've lived in this industry for that long. Do you think there has been shifts to what, what that is about and, and how limiting that has been? Um, I mean, I, it's surprising that, um, you know, the culture doesn't evolve forward yeah. <laughs> all the time, almost never, you know. You think it is, um, 
and there are trappings of it, certainly. But, you know, the fact that it's 2016 and we're still talking about women trying to get equal pay for women, it's, you know, it's kind of crazy. Um, but I feel like, yes, you know, I don't like going into music stores because it's still like the attitude a lot of men show towards a woman musician or is, you know, it's still a lot of attitude or, um, you know, it's no different than going to buy a car as a woman or, you know, <laughs> the way salesmen will treat you or something. But, you know, I have to say that there are also, it, maybe I got singled out for being a, the girl in the band or maybe more attention as well. I don't know. So, you know, I c it's all, the only thing I've known, I, I, I did play with uh, just women and also my band Free Kitten with Julie Capritz and Yoshimi from the Boredoms. I mean, that was great because, it, again, it was just, are the personalities forming the music. And um, so it was just playing with people you want to play with. Um, and, uh, you know, there there is, like on every level in um, the music business, women have to deal with uh, sexism, for sure. And it, being in a band is um, almost, more sheltered in a certain, I don't know, like I, you know, I didn't have any experience of being sexually harassed by the record company executive, but it did go on at the, you know, in the music there, you know, at the uh, companies. And um, there was a, I did write a song, about, a song about, about it, about it. <laughs> called yeah. Swimsuit Issue, yeah. Yeah. What about the persistent awareness of your gender? How do you think that's affected you? Well, yeah, I mean, it does make you self con you know, I, I didn't even think about it till we started going to England, and, and um, that's what journalists would ask that question, and they were also puzzled because I just looked like this ordinary girl, and um, I, um, I didn't have a persona like Susie Sue or Lydia Lunch or... Was um, that a conscious decision for you to... Well, in a way, I mean, I... Uh, I don't know, I've just... Unfortunately, <laughs> I was just felt so middle class, like I'm never gonna dress this up, you know. <laughs> uh, but it also, it's, that's more of an English thing. I think it's a way, you know, to escape your class and everybody, you know, during that time, um, well, I forget what the movement was, but it was you know, like people really having these personas and going out to clubs and, and, um, and you would wear it all day long no matter what, you know, like a costume. Um, and it just, we're also influenced by American hardcore and which was very boy and boy wearing t-shirts and and um, there weren't really any, except for Kira in Black Flag. I mean, there were a lot of, you know, uh, girls in punk bands, but hardcore was, seemed much more um, like a sport almost. Seems you know, to have that similar, yeah. that hasn't evolved in the, in the gender question still. But um, anyways, but that was when I first, you know, suddenly started thinking about being a girl in a band and, yeah, and a lot of the journalists were very me. Were <laughs> they, in what way? Um, you know, they were just kind of ageist or just kind of talk about my appearance or something rather than the music. They didn't, they, it was also, it was just kind of a negative thing about Sonic Youth when we first went over. They, they called us um, uh, brats, art school brats living in big lofts <laughs> or something. <laughs> As I, I, I still remember that first bad review. <laughs> you always remember that first bad review. Uh, you've been um, an important role model. You've played a really important role as a, as a woman for other women in the industry and women in general. How does that sit with you? That, because mm. as you say, there wasn't a consciousness around you making a statement as a woman. Um, I mean, it always, I guess it makes me a bit uncomfortable. I, um, cause I don't like, um, I mean, only now do I feel a bit of responsibility towards that. I, I just don't like the idea of feeling like I'm some kind of icon or, um, you know, I feel like I, 
I know what it is to be a role model because I have a daughter, so, and uh, I found that modeling behavior is, by the way, <laughs> the best form of uh, telling a kid, notes. a parent. I'm writing down, I've got a 12 year old. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, uh, it took me a long time to figure that out, but you know, it's, um, so it's weird how that comes back on you. And I, um, I, you know, there's some older women I'll see or like, oh, she hasn't had any face work or, or something. And I, you know, I admire that. So I know what a role model is in terms of that. Yeah. But I don't feel it. It's <laughs> hard, isn't it, when you're, especially when there's not a consciousness. It wasn't like you went out to, to kind of blaze that trail that you did. Mm -hmm. Only in reflection, perhaps, there yeah. is that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think some people are really comfortable with, um, you know, they have a super drive to be famous or, or something, and, um, uh, I, you know, I, I'm not really that comfortable with it. And I, because I, I don't want to feel trapped by it, or uh, you know, I've spent so much of my life not wanting to be labeled, but n I see the value in defining things, definitely. We are, and you, you mentioned it in the, the keynote today, as an audience, we project a lot, as we have with you. And uh, there's that great story about you and LL Cool J. Just, it's such oh. a favorite story in terms of projecting on, you know, concepts. Yeah. And then you met him. Right. It wasn't quite. <laughs> right, yeah. I, um, I really liked his first record a lot. And uh, it was really minimalist. Rick Rubin produced it. Um, and yeah, I was curious. I interviewed him for Spin, and I was really curious to see what kind of rock and roll he liked, or like how much of the aesthetic was his, how much was Rick's. And he said his favorite rock band was Bon Jovi. <laughs> 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 it, it wasn't Sonic Youth, <laughs> you know. But I can, you know. Um, and then Thurston was like, "Well, I can." Bon Jovi's coming into his own now, like the Carpenters, <laughs> you know. Yeah, we right. Can, uh, you know, I can, un you know, he's like, I can understand ha why, you know, in rap music, they'll sample like, or he'll like those big power chords of rock, you know, it's like, um, but then, you know, I really liked his video, um, going back to Cali, that was really influenced when we, me, when we did, um, well, th that whole song was actually about <laughs> LL Cool J, <laughs> really, um, but, and then, yeah, that video influenced Cool Thing. Cool Thing, yeah. Um, you've been working, as you mentioned, Bill Nace with Bodyhead. Um, you've got a new band, Good of Us, there's a, there's a collaboration there. What do you think makes a good collaborator? Hmm. It's just really, like you were saying before, chemistry or, you know, s if you're doing improv music, it's super important that they know how to listen, or, you know, that you just kind of are really sensitive to each other. And uh, when Bill and I first started playing, we were talking about this filmmaker, Catherine Briart, this French filmmaker, and I, ha I had a book about her work that I was really into, and so we were kind of trading that back and forth, and um, and then when we went down in my basement and started playing, well, he came up with the name Body Head, which was, came from the book, yeah. and um, her work is a lot about um, sexuality and control, and blah, blah, that boring stuff. <laughs> uh, and uh, anyway, it was such a good name that we were like, oh, we need to start a band. Um, and it was r just so fun to play with them and it felt just so free. And I kind of, it's like, this is great playing music that you don't have to promote because nobody's gonna care about this. <laughs> it's just too weird. Uh, and then... Uh, you've, so ha you've hated that promotion side of it, haven't you? For Kind of. I mean, it's really flattering to be, you know, asked or the idea that people want to talk to you or interviews. Um, but I kind of just felt burned out on just the whole pressure of putting... There's so much work that is uncreative that goes into promoting a record um, that's just kind of nice just to have it exist in kind of a pure form and just, um, you know, just... Is it also because audiences and, and we project so much onto you that it's, you know, it's also a, a burden to carry every time you have to kind of mm. talk about music? 
Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, those kind of, I, I mean, this kind of interview or interviews that are about other things are much easier than, because interviews about music tend to be, you know, people getting the press release and everything in the press release is what they ask you over and over and over again. Mm. So, um, you know, that's not true with everybody, but a lot of interviews go that way. And um, so it's kind of, you it's a, a lot of pressure on you to make it interesting or make it something yeah. else. And um, if you're on the telephone doing a phoner and it's all like static and the person that speaks English in an unbroken fashion, you know, whatever it is, it's just like, it's very, you know, difficult. You're um, about to release another single under your name. Is it next week? Uh, I think it comes out the 12th. Yeah, this is a digital release, yeah. Uh, you've collaborated with a producer, Justin, is it Raisin? Yeah. Yeah, what was that like? Uh, that was fun because I, he basically, I gave him materials, you know, he had vocals and uh, leftovers from some other, the outtakes from some other um, artist he was working with that I, he asked me to come in and sing on and I made some lyrics up and he kind of, um, he made this loop uh, rhythm and bass and um, kind of put my vocals on it and sent it to me and it sounded kind of good, nice and trashy and so I, I went back and I did more vocals and guitar and we mixed it and it came out surprisingly surprisingly catchy. <laughs> I did, I heard, I heard a sneak peek of it and it's amazing. It's called Murdered Out. Mm -hmm. What's the ideas behind it because they're really interesting too. Um, well, in LA, on um, low rider car culture, uh, since I moved back to LA about a year ago, I noticed more and more cars that are just like sprayed with uh, black matte spray paint and the tires are black, the windows are all tinted. And um, it's this kind of, um, I just thought it was interesting, it was like, you know, taking something, and especially in LA, cars are such status symbols, and making it your own, kind of um, just blacking it out. And I kind of saw it as a way of, in the culture, saying I'm not there, you know, I'm kind of um, not participating in the glossy world of, um, uh, you know, Los Angeles. And then I started seeing it that aesthetic at other places, like it's already crept into the mainstream. There's a closed label called Murdered Out, and you see houses that are kind of black on black, or sort yeah. of dark gray on We're gray. We're seeing that a lot in our suburbs, a lot of black hmm. happening. You painted your picket fence. Well, yeah, well, I took out the picket fence and p made a baby seal black fence. <laughs> 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 and I was doing, I was actually, I was doing some um, painting with black matte spray paint before I wrote the lyrics, but. Yeah, it's really, it's an interesting time, isn't it? That whole concept of, of blacking out, not participating, it mm. goes back to that, how punk is getting expressed in, in other forms, maybe mm. other than music. Yeah. Last time I spoke to you, you were just about to release this book and uh, it's now been out for what? Maybe 12, but over 18 months maybe. Mm -hmm. How's it been, you were, you know, sort of saying it was, bit nerve-wracking to have everybody read it, to have friends read it. How's the experience been sharing a very intimate uh, story of your life? Um, it's been okay, you know, it's been better than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, d I don't, uh, you know, when I was writing it, I was really trying not to think about what people would think or I just, like I work in a lot of ways with my work or music, like I kind of just, jump into it. Um, I was definitely concerned about um, uh, band members, you know, not Thurston, but, <laughs> uh, you know, Lee and Steve, you know, only even because uh, if you describe somebody in a flattering way, sometimes I don't even like it. You know, people just they're are very sensitive about how they're described or, and I, I didn't, purposely talk a lot about Sonic Youth because I know somebody will eventually do a good Sonic Youth book and this wasn't really meant to be about that. It was meant to be just 
my life as an artist and kind of the, as part of my kind of you know trip. Um, has it changed you in the writing of this book, looking back and and telling a story, mm. even if it has elements of of putting it together mm. for a narrative? Does it did it change how you f saw yourself? Um, it did actually make me um, have to finally s look at myself in a certain way and say, okay, this is this is it. I'm not like I can't hide from myself. You know, I can't. It's one thing not to want to be labeled by other people, but you suddenly have to, you know, account and take stock. And it, you know, there's a way to look back and figure out how I got to where I am in my life and. Writing is really the only way I know how to think about things, so it was, you know, super interesting. Has there been a freedom in that? Yeah, well, I, I like writing. I mean, it's, you know, uh, I procrastinate a lot, but I, I do really like having something like that to do every day. Or I don't do it every day. <laughs> I think about it, but. <laughs> <laughs> you procrastinate around yeah. it. Another book, potentially, for you? Um, I don't know, if I do another book, it'll be more like a novella. <laughs> <laughs> no, it'll be uh, you know s kind of more of an art book. Yeah. I think part fiction, part unfiction. <laughs> the unfiction, <laughs> the murdered out. Um, we're almost about to wrap up, but we've got a room full of you know music community, s emerging artists, uh, people who have been around for a while. What do you think is the the thing that has kept your career in inverted commas? so authentic and uh, non-compromising. What, what for you, still forging forward about to release a great single, what has it been for you to maintain this for such a long time? Um, I don't know, like it definitely is, um, you know, fuzzy sometimes, like the decisions you make or what, um, you know, I just try to remember what I can live with and, and uh, what I can go out and promote and feel good about. And Coco, as being, as you said, when you're role modeling for somebody, mm -hmm. just making those conscious choices. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And the future is looking good. Um, <laughs> I hope so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't know. I'm excited about um, this single coming out, and there's a new body head record, and I'm doing some artwork. And yeah, and you'll also be in Melbourne uh, next week, I think. This week, actually tomorrow. Tomorrow <laughs> or Friday. So if you're in Melbourne, uh, there'll be another conversation with Vegan Squared as well. Kim Gordon, I can speak on behalf of this room and all of us. Thank you so much for joining us Thanks. here. Thank you for your words and. Thank you for this incredible, uh, you know, career of wonderful music and art that you have shared with us over the time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Kim Gordon. Thanks. Thank you.